Get started with anything else. How are we doing on the readings? Anybody have any questions from your readings? In, in general, there have been a lot of referrals to Aramaic words. Uh, Aramaic. Aramaic. But my thought with the New Testament was written in Greek, so why are we getting Aramaic words? In? Uh, the reason that they refer to Aramaic words, there's two reasons. One is because Jesus would likely have been speaking Aramaic when he talked to his friends. Aramaic was the common language of the day. Um, pretty much everybody would have spoken Greek as well. Uh, most of the Jews, at least the Hebraic Jews, not, perhaps not the Hellenized Jews, would have spoken Hebrew. Aramaic was the common language. Because Aramaic was the common language, and not everybody spoke, um, when the New Testament was being written, not everybody could read Greek. The majority could, but not everyone. Very early on, we have what are called the Targums. The, particularly the Syriac Targums, um, which were written in Aramaic. They were Aramaic translations of the Greek New Testament. So the reason you often will see references to Aramaic words is, one, because they're clarifying that, yeah, they are, they are paying attention to the language Jesus probably actually was speaking in, even though the people who wrote about it wrote about it in Greek. But also, some of the very earliest documents, New Testament documents that we have, some of the oldest extant documents, are actually the targets, which means that we have those words in Aramaic. And so from a scholarly point of view, they often will refer to that as an early additional source document to the Greek New Testament. Okay. Um, that's the main reason. I, if, if there was never any regard given to the Aramaic uh, equivalent, in fact, I have an Aramaic reference today to when we talk about kingdom. Um, then it might suggest a disregard for, for the words Jesus probably actually used. And so there is an, an Aramaic concern in that regard. Okay? And remember, Aramaic is, um, is related to Chaldean. It came from, it became the common language when the Israelites were in, in exile in Babylon because it's related to, it's a Semitic language that's related to Hebrew, but it was similar to the Chaldean that the, the Babylonians spoke. Tomas? I was just wondering, did Jesus as a boy have to learn various languages, or was this a gift from God that he knew how to do subjects well, and things? Or? Growing up where he did at the time he did, everybody spoke multiple languages. I mean, it's just like, um, I know kids here who have, uh, for instance, most of you all know um, Heather Coxwell yes. Flores' kids. Well, they have a a Mexican father, an American mother, they go back and forth between English and Spanish without even thinking about it. Well, the same thing would likely have been true with Jesus and others who grew up where he did, when he did. The everyday street language was Aramaic, but there were still a lot of people who spoke Hebrew, and yet the, the more formal language was Greek. That was just the culture they grew up in, and so they learned those languages. Um, I had the experience in when I was in Jerusalem, the first, first time I was there, um, this little kid came up to me on the street, and he, you know, he wanted to be my tour guide to show me around Jerusalem. He was probably nine years old, and he spoke to me in German. Well, I speak some German, and I went, no, he spoke to me in French. No, he spoke to me in Hebrew. Maybe I was actually, you know, Jewish. No, you know, Italian. No, English. Okay, he went, ah, you know, are you an American? You know, and then he starts talking to me in English. The world he grows up, grew up in, in Jerusalem, in the, this was in the early 80s, um, late, late 70s, I guess. Um, you know, that's how he made his living. He learned all the different languages of all the different people. Well, that's an extreme example of the fact that Jesus growing up, the kids in the street spoke Aramaic. His parents, he was taught Hebrew because that was part of the upbringing of a Jewish boy. Um, and then, in all likelihood, he learned Greek because that was the more formal language. You always knew you could talk to somebody in Greek. So it wasn't that he was somehow miraculously, you know, endowed. That was probably just every kid. And it's an interesting thing about the Greek, though, and then I'll come to you, Ron. Um, for centuries, we had no exam. Uh, the, the New Testament is written in common Greek, not not formal Greek. It's actually called Koine Greek, is what it's called. Um, we had no examples of Koine Greek except the Bible for centuries. And the early scholars used to refer to it as Holy Ghost Greek because they thought that this was a special language that the Holy Spirit had taught the apostles to use. And then later on, because of archaeology and the development of all of those you know, sciences, 
They started finding a lot of other examples of it and came to the conclusion that there was formal or academic Greek, and then there was sort of street Greek, the common Greek, the, the thing that you would, you know, talk to somebody else in an ordinary language that spoke Greek, and, and that's what Koine or common Greek is. It's just like, if any of you all studied German, well, okay, in German you have common German, but then you have Hochdeutsch, yeah. high German. And you, you try speaking academic or Hochdeutsch to somebody who's speaking German, and they're going to think, what is wrong with you? And same thing in Greek. You have a common Greek, and then you have a formal Greek. Ron? Yes, I, I, an observation uh, in Europe. It's amazing uh, how many languages are spoken by everybody. Yeah, and I, I once was, I had a, a secretary, an assistant. I worked for Fuller Seminary when I was a student there. And she and her husband had come over from the Netherlands. And uh, she, he was a student, and she got a job working in uh, the offices at the school that I was working in. And we were talking one day, you know, you, you've heard the expression, somebody who speaks three languages is trilingual, somebody who speaks two languages is bilingual, somebody who speaks one language is an American. <laughs> so I, here I was, you know, she spoke like three languages, and I was going, oh yeah, well, I'm a typical American, you know, I speak a little German, but mostly just English. And she said, you know, you shouldn't beat yourself up about that. She said, I, I live in a place where if I drive one hour, I can be in places where they speak three or four different languages. And so it's natural for me to learn them. She said, how far do you have to go before you get to a place where they speak a, a different language? She said, I don't, I don't blame Americans for not learning other languages. Well, I'm not going to give us a complete buy. You know, I think we, we need to be more responsible about being world citizens than that. But um, still, I mean, she, she said, oh, yeah, you guys, I, if I was an American, I wouldn't speak any English either, because you have to go so far. So it's a different perspective. Judy. Um, the, uh, the disciples, they couldn't understand what, what Jesus was trying to tell them. And, you know, he spoke with parables, and they couldn't understand that. Why couldn't they understand these things? I mean, were they um, all the miracles that... Well, they understood the miracles. Yeah, that part they I got. Mean, I mean, wouldn't they get that he's someone other than an ordinary? They did periodically. Now, you really have to understand that being Jews, the I the, and their expectation for the Messiah, which they they decided fairly early on, Jesus was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. After Andrew and Nathaniel first met Jesus, and Andrew goes back to get his brother Simon. This is this is at the very start. Andrew says, "Simon, come and see. We have found the Messiah." So they had a sense that he was the Messiah from very early on, but they didn't think of the Messiah as being a miracle worker, and certainly not as being divine. They expected he was going to be King David. We don't have any record of King David performing any miracles, not even the parting of the sea or anything like that. He was a general and a, and a leader. Um, or Judas Maccabeus, who came before, and Judas Maccabeus was a great military leader. He drove off the Seleucids and all that, but he was a miracle worker. So they saw all these miracles and they thought, that is really cool, that's spectacular. But it still didn't quite sink in what he was. I mean, if you met somebody who, you know, <coughs> cured somebody from, miraculously from, visibly cured them from diseases or raised somebody from the dead or walked on the waters of Lake Chapala, you might be a little confused about what this is all about too. Um, and so I think that, that, and then he talks, you know, if I were to say to you, let me explain the real meaning of life. There was a sower, and he took seeds out, and he scattered these seeds, and part of them fell on a hard path, and part of them fell amongst the rocky soil, and part of them fell on the thorns, and part of them fell on good soil, and the good soil produced a great return, uh, 30, 60, even 100 fold. And you go, right. What? You know? That's very much what the, what the disciples were going through. The dis disciples were not learned men. They weren't well educated. They weren't, they didn't have a global sense of things. And so the reason why it took Jesus three plus years of working with these guys and teaching them, and it says, this is the passage from Mark 4 that we used, I used for sermon, is he spoke to them in parables, and it said, and he, he spoke to them in parables as much as they could understand, and he always took them aside afterwards and explained it to them. Okay? So yeah, they could be a little thick. And Jesus often said, you guys are a little thick. <laughs> but at the same time, what they were having to absorb and the way Jesus was presenting it didn't make it easy. I mean, in hindsight, it doesn't look that tough to us, but think about what it would be like if you had no context for any of that. Then it would be hard. But they eventually did get it. 
And that's why we are Christians, because of the spread of the church. Kind well, of. just one other small point. They had not received the Holy Spirit yet either. That's true. So they had a totally natural mind without having any, uh, any, any spirit within them to maybe give them a little help. Exactly. Now, they had flashes, which I yes. think were inspirations of spirit. In fact, in Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked them the question, I'm going to refer to that passage in teaching today, um, says, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some people say you're Elijah, some say John the Baptist, come back, some say this, some say that. And Jesus says, well, what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, meaning the anointed one, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, it is not by human intelligence that you understand that. This is something given to you by God. And Kenneth's exactly right. There were these flashes of sort of inspiration that I believe the Holy Spirit was, you know, giving understanding in various places. But in terms of being con regularly with them to teach them and to give them the understanding of, of things, that didn't happen until after Jesus' ascension at the day of Pentecost. And then, again, one of the great responsibilities of the Spirit is to teach us, as well as to give us comfort and to exhort us and to convict us of our sin and various other things, but to teach us. And so they had, they had advantage after that. Right. One one question I had. Uh, there's a reference to anybody who blasphemes the Holy Spirit is guilty of an unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. I guess I not. You think you might be there? <laughs> no, no. I, I guess I guess I have been unaware of an unforgivable sin. Yeah, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, um, and there's people who disagree on this. This this is a hard one. This is one of the hard sayings of Jesus. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I believe the best interpretation of that is to, a blasphemy is to elevate the things of, that, that are human to the level of the divine or pull the things that are divine down to the human level. Okay, in other words, to defame God is what blasphemy is. If the Holy Spirit speaks to, to me, and I know that it's the truth, something in me says this is true. Jesus is the Son of God. And that message is clear to me because the Holy Spirit said it to me. And I still say, I don't care. I'm not going to I'm not going to follow that. I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to live by that. Then in effect, what I've done is I have defamed the testimony of the third person of the Trinity. I have I have blown the Holy Spirit off. I've called him a liar, so to speak. That I believe is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, where we refuse to accept. What we know, because of what the Holy Spirit has told us, what we know to be the truth. Now, it's the, it's the unforgivable sin as long as we're committing it. But it's possible for us at some point in the future to say, I'm sorry. You know, I, I was wrong. You know, I, I defied the Holy Spirit. I defied you, God. I, I was wrong. Forgive me for that. Then we are no longer guilty of the blasphemy. Okay. All right. That's where I was. Thinking. So as long as we are committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which means we do not accept the testimony of Jesus Christ as the Son of God uh, as being real and true, we call the Holy Spirit a liar. That is unforgivable, because in effect we're we're denying God. But we can repent of that, change that, and say, "I was wrong. I'm sorry. I believe. I accept the testimony of the Spirit." Then we're no longer committing the sin, and we can be forgiven. Is that fair? Okay. Just Pardon? a step farther that we don't okay. actually say, but our words and our actions are that we are not abiding by what He's shown us to be the way to live. So you know, without saying I don't believe it, we're just showing it. Yeah. Well, and it's 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 we don't have to say I don't believe it, but we, if we don't say I do believe it, it's the yeah, same thing. Yeah. yeah. We're we're committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit by you know by negation rather than by. <coughs> An affirmative of no, I refuse. Okay. Anything else? Anything from the readings? You could type for a book, affirmative of no. What's that? <laughs> you just said that we're complying with the affirmative of no. Yeah. And well, that's a good book. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no. I'd have to write that one. Uh, my spare time. Okay, shall we get started? Let me open with a word of prayer. Father, we ask for your presence. We ask you by your Holy Spirit to teach us. May we learn of you. May you make clear things that sometimes feel dense to us. And may we grow closer to you because of it.
Teach us of your Son and of the gospel of the kingdom of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I'm going to need this one more than that one. Um, this is the outline. I changed it last week. I haven't changed it again yet, but it could happen. Today we're talking about the gospel of the kingdom of God. Those of you who were in church on Sunday, I preached on this from the fourth chapter of Mark. I had not planned that. These sort of providential coincidences that happen when things occur all at the same time. I just happened to be going through Mark in a sermon series, and I dealt with uh, passages, the passages, the parables of the kingdom in the middle of the, God, the chapter four of Mark, and then had already scheduled that today would be when we talk about the gospel of the kingdom of God. Next week, the ministries of Jesus, of preaching and teaching, of healing and of exorcism, and then relationships, then rejection of final days and uh, last days, and then sin and its remedy. Thank you all for showing up today. Wrong day. Next week, we will be meeting on our usual day. We'll be back to Thursdays next week, and then I'll tell you after that what we're going to do. Okay? <laughs> Um, it's, you can't tell the players about a program. Uh, any questions about any of this? All right. Today, I want to answer the question, what was Jesus' core message? What was the primary thing that Jesus had to tell his disciples and therefore has had to tell us? I should also say, by the way, that the lecture material I have for today, I developed leaning very, very heavily on works by... Um, Mark D. Roberts, who is a PhD, a pastor, um, he has wonderful materials on the, the, the kingdom of God, and, and he, was, he said all the things in his materials that I would say in all the right order, and so and he gives permission uh, online to use his materials. So I want to give him full credit. He does say acknowledge your source if you're going to use the stuff, but then you're free to do it. So I acknowledge that Mark D. Roberts is a really smart guy, and I'm going to use a lot of his material today. Um, <laughs> So the question is, what was Jesus' primary message or his core message? The answer very simply is, that, is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God as an expression occurs 69 times in 10 different New Testament books, especially in the Gospels. Now in the book of Matthew, Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven as an expression, and he uses that 32 times. He much prefers kingdom of heaven to kingdom of God. Most of these cases, by the way, in the Gospels, is actually Jesus himself using that expression. I'm going to talk a little bit later about why I think Matthew uses kingdom of heaven, but I'll say at this point that those two are synonymous. Some people have tried to make a theological difference between them, but the fact that there are parallel passages in Matthew and either Mark or Luke, for instance, where the, it's, it's verbatim, it's the same language, it's the same expression, but it's kingdom of heaven in Matthew and kingdom of God in one of the others, and then there are places where the expression changes in mid-course. You know, they, you know, what's the kingdom of heaven like? Well, the kingdom of God is like. And so these two expressions are synonymous. People who try to make a theological difference, I think, are straining in that. So I don't think that's, that's valid. These are the same things. And so basically, we're looking at over 100 times in the New Testament, almost all of them in the Gospels, we have this expression, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. A couple of examples of that. Mark 1, 14 and 15, and Mark 1, 15 I'm going to refer to several times because it's sort of the, the key here in terms of Jesus' core message. Um, says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Good news, of course, is gospel. That's what, that's what gospel means, is good news. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Then from Luke 4... Verses 40, uh, this is verse 43. I didn't carry over to 44. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. He's in Capernaum, and they want him to stay there. They don't want him to leave. And he goes, no, I got, I got other places I got to go, guys. I need to preach the kingdom of God other places too, because that's why I came here. And then Luke 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. It often uses that expression, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. But kingdom of God over and over and over again is what Jesus is talking about. It is his primary message, far and above anything else. In fact, George Eldon Ladd, who a uh, New Testament scholar, he actually was the head of the New Testament department at... Fuller Seminary, where I did my Master of Divinity, 
up until I think the year before I got there, but his influence was widely seen, so I've always been familiar with George Elvin Ladd. He said this about kingdom of God. This theme of the coming of the kingdom of God was central in Jesus' mission. His teaching was designed to show men how they might enter the kingdom of God. His mighty works were intended to uh, prove that the kingdom of God had come upon them. His parables illustrated to his disciples the truth about the kingdom of God. And when he taught his followers to pray, at the heart of their petition were the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. On the eve of his death, he assured his disciples that he would yet share with them the happiness and the fellowship of the kingdom, and he promised that he would appear again on the earth in glory to bring the blessedness of the kingdom to those for whom it was prepared. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he uses examples and parables and stories. He talks about the kingdom of God as a mustard seed, as a treasure to be found, as a merchant looking for pearls, as a king who gives a banquet. He unwraps this idea of the kingdom of God in every way imaginable. And yet, having said that, there is wide disagreement about what the kingdom of God means. Many Christians have never dealt with this issue, or if they have, many Christians have a wrong idea about what the kingdom of God means. And yet, it's the core message that Jesus had. It's not one that we can afford to get wrong. Uh, another uh, wonderful scholar is Gordon Fee, who actually taught at the other place I did graduate work, which was Regent College in Vancouver. Gordon Fee said this, you cannot know anything about Jesus, anything, if you miss the kingdom of God. You are zero on Jesus if you don't understand this term. I'm sorry to say it that strongly, but this is the great failure of evangelical Christianity. We have had Jesus without the kingdom of God, and therefore have literally done Jesus in. If we don't have a concept of what the kingdom of God means, then we don't really have any sort of grasp of what Jesus was talking about. That's how important this is. And that's why, you know, along the way, in terms of talking in the life of Jesus and various messages that, that were relevant to particular parts of his life in this class on life and teachings of Jesus, I felt like we had to take two hours and focus just on this one message because it is so central to everything else. Okay? So... What is the kingdom of God? Um, first, I'm going to talk about what it isn't and how people misunderstand it. Some people claim or have claimed that the kingdom of God is simply um, a, an expression that means heaven. That Jesus was simply saying, now you can go to heaven when you die. You know, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. I think particularly this is the way we might explain this to kids. That... Um, that Jesus came so that we might have the kingdom of heaven, and that means uh, if you accept Jesus when you die, you're going to go there, to heaven. All right? Other people have suggested that the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with the church. I actually played on this understanding a little bit yesterday when I preached, because I was talking about the kingdom of heaven, the growth of the, of the church as exemplifying the kingdom of heaven um, down through history because of the, uh, the parables of the mustard seed and the parables of the growing plants that, that the person who sowed them has no control over, doesn't even know how it works. These are not completely wrong, but they're very limited. They're only one small aspect of it. You could say the kingdom of heaven is, and the kingdom of God is about heaven, the kingdom of God is about the church, but it's much more than that. Other people have said that the kingdom of heaven um, They've seen it as a world infused with divine justice. I've got a couple typos in here. Uh, meaning that Jesus announced that it was time for the kingdom of God to take place, and that meant that there was justice and equality, and everybody's taken care of, and we're all living the way we ought to live. Eh, that's a little further off the mark. Obviously, Jesus advocated that there be justice and equality and everything, but I don't think that's what he meant when he was talking about the kingdom of God. And finally furthest off the mark of the things sometimes uh, people say, is that the more spiritually inclined people, read New Agey, okay, uh, people will say that the kingdom of God is referring to the inner awareness you have of your own divinity, literally to recognize the God that is in you. And I don't think so. I don't think that was a message of Jesus's because we don't have God in us. We may be made in the image of God, but we are not divine creatures. We are created creatures. 
And in fact, all of these interpretations are at best inadequate or, as in the last of those four, uh, completely wrong, simply downright wrong. And yet these are the kinds of conceptions people often have about what the kingdom of God means. That's, these are the things the kingdom of God isn't, or at least they're inadequate in terms of the scope of trying to describe the kingdom of God. The reason I believe that there are a lot of misunderstandings about the kingdom of God, the first reason at least, is because we have an inherent language problem when we talk about this. In English, the word kingdom means a place. It's a locality. A kingdom is a place where a king reigns, right? That's what that word means to us. And yet, that's not what the word means in Greek or in Aramaic or in Hebrew. In Greek, the expression, uh, hevasilia tu theo, the kingdom of God, means literally the reign or rule or authority or sovereignty of the king. It does not mean a location. It means the authority that the king has by which he rules, not where he rules. Likewise, here's the Aramaic. The Aramaic word malku, which is the word that Jesus probably actually would have spoken when he talked about the kingdom of God, it has the same meaning. It is the sovereignty, the rule, the authority by which the king rules, not the place where he rules. And we actually have a parable that Jesus told that gives us an illustration of that. Uh, Luke 19, 12 to 13, talks about, uh, and I'm quoting here, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. This expression, to be appointed king, is the same word. It literally means he went, this, this passage, in a more literal translation, would be, he went to a distant country to get a kingdom, Basileia, for himself. Meaning he went to a, 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 a faraway place to somehow get new and greater authority to rule over the place where he'd already lived. Right? He didn't go to a different place, which was the kingdom. He went to get a kingdom, meaning the authority, the right, the power, the sovereignty to rule where he already was. Kingdom means the reign or rule of a king. It does not mean the location where the king rules. Now, uh, an expression, when we talk about going to a distant country to get a kingdom, you will remember that it feels like just yesterday. Last week when we were talking about the, uh, bye guys, everything all right? The doctor. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, it's Aaron. Uh, yes, yeah, okay. they've been looking for an endocrinologist. Is there no one? Uh, sorry. Um, let me pray for her right now. Yes. Father, we lift up to you Aaron, and we know she has struggled with this illness for a long time, and we pray that you would uh, give wisdom to the doctor and understanding that he can help treat her. If a specialist is needed, we pray that you would give them direction to a specialist to assist her with that, and we would ask for healing. Uh, heal her body, give her the energy and strength that she needs, and resolve her illness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, last time we met, and I was talking about why some, some scholars have talked about when Mary, Joseph, and Jesus went into Egypt, that they only went for like two weeks and then they came back right away because uh, that's how they explain how they went to the temple 40 days after Jesus was born and yet they also ran from Herod and you know Herod was at the point of death. The problem with that is that Archelaus, it says that when they came back from Egypt, Archelaus was ruling in Samaria and Judea. He was one of Herod's the great sons. And that they didn't go back to Bethlehem. Instead, they went up to Galilee because Galilee uh, was not where Archelaus was ruling. And Archelaus was a really bad guy. The Romans actually deposed him after a time because he was such a bad ruler. Well, Archelaus, the three, three of the sons, you know, most of the others have been killed by, by Herod the Great. Three of Herod the Great's sons, when Herod the Great died, they went to Rome because the Romans were in charge. The three of them each appealed to Caesar to make them the king over Palestine. And uh, Caesar ended up doing what Herod the Great had suggested in the, his last will, because he changed his will not long before he died, and that is that the kingdom be broken up between the three of them, and it was. Herod Philip was given an area, um, uh, Galatinus, um, uh, 
Herod Antipas was given Galilee and Berea, and Archelaus was given Judea and Samaria. That's exactly what we're talking about here when we talk about somebody going to a distant land to, to get their kingdom. They didn't, they didn't go to Rome and appeal to Caesar in order to get, to get a location. They were going to get the authority to rule where they already had come from. And that's what this story is from in Luke 19. He went to get a kingdom, meaning he went to get the authority to be the ruler, to the, the authority to be the king over the place where he was. That's what the word kingdom, basileia, means in Greek. It does not mean a place. And so we get fouled up when we talk about kingdom of God, first of all, because our language is inadequate here. Basileia is translated kingdom. That's not a good translation in terms of what we think that means. Do that, you understand what I mean by that? And you can refer to Luke 145, or to uh, Psalm 145 as well, because it deals with some of that same topic. Uh, it says... All your works shall give you thanks, O Lord, and all your faithfulness shall bless you. You shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. Kingdom and power are parallelisms there. They refer to the same thing. So it's not saying you shall, the, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom, meaning the place, and tell of your power. It means they shall speak of the glory of your authority to be king, and of your power, all right? The kingdom and the power and the glory. Kingdom means the sovereign rule. Great story, the pastor that, that I had before, Earl Palmer, in Seattle at the University Press, uh, Bruce Larson was his name, he had a grandson. And they were driving along on the freeway in Seattle one time, and the freeway's elevated, so you can look down on the city. They're driving along, and it's not there anymore, but you used to be able to see the kingdom. Well, his grandson was like three and a half. And he's in the seat, drive along, and Bruce Larson said, I looked over and I said, he said, oh, look, there's the kingdom. And he said, and his grandson said, and the power and the glory. <laughs> and Bruce Larson said, now there's a grandson. <laughs> um, kingdom and the power and the glory. Kingdom doesn't mean a place. It means the, the, the sovereign rule. Okay? So we need to start with that understanding. So, having said that, when we talk about what is the kingdom of God, we need to understand that when Jesus proclaims that the kingdom of God has come near, as he does in Mark 1.15, he doesn't mean that there's some location approaching. The kingdom doesn't come near if a kingdom means a location. But rather, Jesus is saying that God's own royal power has come on the scene. Again, Mark 1, 15, another way we could translate that is God's reign is at hand. God's power has been unleashed or is being unleashed. Turn your life around. Put your trust in this good news. The kingdom of God means God's power, his authority, his sovereignty is here. It has arrived. And we need to see, too, that this understanding of the meaning of the kingdom of God is also completely consistent with what the Jewish prophets had always meant when they talked about God's kingdom. Because there's a lot of Old Testament prophetic references to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God arriving. Uh, one of them is from Isaiah 52, starting with the seventh verse. It says, how beautiful on, and you, you've heard this probably, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. There's that reign of God. Okay. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm at the sight of all the nations, and all of the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Now, the Hebrew there in the your God reigns, which I have in a different color, is the same root word. It's um, the, the Aramaic is malku, it's malkuhum in Hebrew. It means God's kingdom reign is there. And then it goes on to describe what that's going to look like when the presence of God, the sovereignty of God, the rule of God is present to the Hebrews. Another passage is Zephaniah 3 which says, Sing, daughter Zion, sing aloud Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. 
The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Again, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. In Hebrew, a literal translation of that would be the power of God has arrived. The sovereignty of God has arrived. The kingdom of God has arrived. So, all through the Old Testament prophets and into the time of Jesus, when they talk about the kingdom and the, the reign of God, the kingdom of God, they're talking about the very power of God in our midst. And Jesus, that's what he means when he says the kingdom of God. God's authority, his sovereignty, his power, his rule, his reign over his creation. Now, questions about that? Yes, Rob. Well, I guess, I guess I've got a naive... Uh or a failure to comprehend, because I, I presume that while Christ was here, he was preaching the gospel or salvation, and how salvation accomplished. He doesn't really go into salvation here. He leaves that to the disciples. Well, he does. I mean, he's not in the passages. Jesus did talk about um, salvation. But when he's talking about the kingdom of God, he's sort of setting, he's setting the table for everything that's to come. He is inviting the apostles and his immediate disciples to accept him as being the presence of the kingdom of God, meaning that Jesus is the incarnate presence of the sovereignty of God. And the whole point is to be back in relationship with God by accepting that presence of God in their midst. Is that the message he's giving to the world, though, at the same time? Yes, I think so. I mean, he, the, the way Jesus spoke to the world is by speaking, speaking to and teaching his disciples first. All right? which is why Jesus didn't appear in the, early in the 21st century, just go on TV. Okay. He talked the 12 and then the others beyond that and made sure they were understood that he sent the Holy Spirit so that they would have that authority and power and understanding by the Holy Spirit, and then they became the microphone by which this message got broadcast. Now I'm going to talk more about what's involved in the, in the kingdom of God, and that might help answer some of your question too. To get at this, there are several other questions I want to answer. The first one would be, how did Jesus proclaim the kingdom of God? How did he get into this? Um, he did Jesus in a lot of different ways, as I suggested earlier, through just flat statements, through parables, through uh, not just words but actions. Jesus made clear what the kingdom of God was all about. This is a passage from Mark 10 where Jesus begins to unwrap or explain what the kingdom of God is. Mark 10, 14 to 16. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Now, a lot of these verses that I'm using, I'm sure you heard. But did you realize how often the kingdom of God is the center point of this? Twice in this passage, he refers to the kingdom of God. Now, there's several, every time he uses it, there's something else for us to learn. Here, I think one of the key messages we have to, have to uh, pay attention to is that the kingdom of God is something we receive. It is not something we either create or that we can take by our own efforts. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, unless you receive the kingdom of God like a little child. A little child doesn't go out and say, all right, I've made a theological determination, I am going to you know, claim the kingdom of God. They just receive what is given to them. And that's how we receive the kingdom of God. There are people, Christians, who will talk about, and I've heard churches do this, they will talk about bringing in the kingdom, that they have a responsibility to bring in the kingdom or to usher in the kingdom, they sometimes will say. And if they say that, then they miss the biblical point that only God can bring the kingdom. It is not by effort of ours that we can somehow forcibly bring the kingdom of God to bear. We receive it like a little child, as it is offered to us in Jesus. Unless we receive it like a little child, then we can't have it. All right? um, that's one of the ways in which I think, not only that Jesus presents this, but that people seriously misunderstand it. The kingdom of God is the power and rule of God, and you can't make that happen. God's already done everything that needs to be done, and, and you can receive what God has done and what he's made evident in Jesus. Now, I'm going to keep going here. Jesus also describes the kingdom of God in parables. 
These next two parables I talked about yesterday. And my sermon's online if you want to go hear, hear it. This is what the kingdom of God is like, Jesus says in Mark 4. A man scattered seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. This is what the kingdom of God is like, he says, that the seed gets planted, and whether the man sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't even know how. So much for us being responsible for bringing the kingdom of God in. We don't even know how it works. We can go to sleep, and when we wake up, we will find that the kingdom of God has grown. Because this is one of the parables of the kingdom. This is what the kingdom of God is like, Jesus said. So it's not something we make happen. Right after that, there's one sort of little connecting passage, and then Mark 4.30 says, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? You can see why these are called parables of the kingdom. Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. The kingdom of God may start out small, in your life, in your place, it may be the simple introduction. But the promise is, without us even knowing how it's going to grow, it will grow into an enormous plant. The black mustard that they, that they grow in the Middle East starts out, as I said sermon yesterday, a tiny, tiny seed. In fact, it takes about 750 of those seeds to make a gram. There's 28 grams in an ounce, so you're talking about somewhere around 22,000 of those seeds in one ounce. And yet, one of those black mustard seeds can grow into a plant as much as 15 feet tall in one season. That's what the kingdom of God is like. Just the tiniest little bit can grow into an enormous, powerful thing. And I use the analogy that that's what God has done in the church, the church being the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, that through, through very, very few people, through Jesus himself, the 12, and then a few more than that, uh, I, just, I just read a new statistic this morning as I was studying for a church history class, that by the year 100, see if I can remember this correctly, 86% of all port cities in the Eastern Roman Empire had churches or Christian communities. They may have been house churches, they weren't formal churches. And 36% of all rural towns did. And that's within 70 years of Jesus' death. Talk about a giant plant growing very quickly. Right? And that's when it was illegal to be a Christian. So, extraordinary growth. The kingdom of God will make itself manifest. <coughs> The presence of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God will be present, whether we understand how it works or not. This same thing, this mustard seed analogy, you know, a tiny mustard seed growing into a great plant, there's a beautiful echo of that in Jewish prophetic literature um, in the book of Ezekiel 17. And listen to this wonderful parallel or echo to Jesus talking about the mustard plant. The prophet Ezekiel said, This is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar, and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountainside. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Cedars are big trees, okay? Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. Again, this, this um, metaphor for God taking a tiny thing and planting it so that it grows into a great thing as a metaphor for the rule and sovereignty, the kingdom of God in the world is a very powerful thing. Um, and very beautiful as well. Ezekiel, very poetic here. So Jesus used parables, he used expressions, he tried to help us explain that, but then he not only used those kinds of words, Jesus also educated and taught about the kingdom of God by his actions, by his works. First of all, he did it by healing. Throughout the, all of the Hebrew prophets, there's always a sense in which when miraculous healing occurs, it is a sign of God's presence, of God's power, if you will, of God's reign on the earth. 
The Hebrew prophets saw miraculous healing as a sign that God's kingdom was at work. God's power was here. Isaiah 35 Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come, he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you, then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped, then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy, water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. Where that expression streams in the desert, which is one of the most popular devotional guides ever written. Okay? So the idea is your God will come. The rule of God, the power of God will make its presence known, and what will be the result? The eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, the mute tongue will shout for joy, the water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The presence of God, the kingdom of God, the rule of God, will be manifested in miraculous occurrences. <coughs> and this is why Jesus performed miracles. He did it for two reasons. Jesus performed miracles, healing miracles especially, for two reasons. One, out of compassion. Jesus had compassion on those who were wounded and hurt and broken and in pain. And he, he and sometimes those who were grieving. That's why he raised the, you know, the son of the widow of Zarephath. That's why he raised Lazarus because he had compassion on those who were suffering that kind of grief. So he did it out of compassion, but he also did it as a witness to the power of the kingdom of God, the presence of God in their midst. Okay? And we have a specific example. When John is in prison, he sends his disciples, because John is imprisoned and he has a moment of doubt. He'd been absolutely sure when he saw Jesus, John the Baptist, that when he saw Jesus, this was the Son of God. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one that I was told to prophesy about. But then when he gets put in prison, apparently he has some doubts. And so John the Baptist sends some of his followers from prison to go and ask Jesus, are you the one that we were, meant, we were told to expect, or is there another one coming? I think it's because John, like everybody else, didn't think Jesus was doing what they thought the Messiah was going to do. He wasn't acting like their expectation of the Messiah. And so John sent the word and said, are you the one, really? And Jesus responds by, by what apparently is his clear definition of what the presence of God, the kingdom of God, the coming of the Messiah is supposed to look like. What is the kingdom of God, the real thing, supposed to look like? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. The evidence that Jesus was the Messiah, the evidence that God's presence and power, his kingdom, had come into their midst, was the miraculous healing and the preaching of the good news to the poor, those who needed to hear. Completely consistent between what the Old Testament prophets expected to be the sign of God's presence and what Jesus said was the absolute sign of God's presence. Presence. That's the reassurance he said back to John. Okay. Any questions about any of that? All right. When we talk about Jesus demonstrating the presence of the kingdom of God by his works, he not only healed people, he then also exorcised the demons. That's exorcised with an O, not an E. Okay. Um, he drove out demons. And most Westerners in the world today don't know how to deal with this. They simply don't know how to receive this. The simple fact is that whether we like it or not, whether we're comfortable with it or not, driving out demons was a central part of Jesus' ministry. He made that a central part of his ministry, and when he prepared others and he sent them out to do ministry, he empowered them to preach and to heal and to drive out demons. If we try to excise any references to the demonic from our gospel, if we try to sort of just skip over the fact that Jesus drove out demons, then we've got it the gospel. That is too fundamental, it's too interwoven with everything else Jesus did for us to simply exclude that from our beliefs. The fact is, if we're not willing to accept that there are negative spiritual forces in the world, then how can we defend that there are positive spiritual forces in the world? A demon is a fallen angel. Do we not believe in angels? Do we not believe in the spirit uh, which is God? You know. 
God does not have a body. God is spirit, and we should worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, we have to accept that the spiritual realm is just as real as the physical realm, or we have no faith at all. And if we accept there's a spiritual realm, why do we not believe that there is an evil aspect of the spiritual realm? The scripture tells us the demons are the fallen angels. Okay? And it is all through the Bible. Matthew 12. It says, Jesus knew their thoughts. He's talking about the Pharisees here. And said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. The Pharisees had been accusing or thinking that Jesus was driving out demons by the power of demons. And so they were thinking the devil has given him the power to drive out these demons. And Jesus knows what's in their mind. So it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, which is literally Lord of the Flies, but it is a, it's a name for Satan. If I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? By then, uh, So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, and here it is, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The power of God, the rule of God, the sovereignty of God has come upon you as demonstrated by the driving out of demons. Mary. Um, <clears throat> was there any evidence that, that people were driving out demons that did not have uh, the Holy Spirit? Or, like I remember in, when Moses was trying to convince Pharaoh, there were all kinds of magicians that Right. Would do the same kind of thing. Right. Until, until, until he couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. The first several of the plagues they were able to reproduce. And your question again is? Um, is there anything that says that people were driving out demons by the power of demons? Like, was there any basis that the Pharisees were? Yeah, there actually, there actually was some history having to do with some of the pagan uh, worship that you would call upon a more powerful demon to deal with the troublesome lesser demon, okay? That there's a hierarchy within the spiritual world and that they would call upon uh, spiritual powers that were supposed to be more powerful even if they were not uh, of God, all right, in order to deal with lesser demons. So that's basically the accusation that they were making against them. And it's also true that... Um, it was not, it's not like Jesus came along and he's driving out demons and he's healing people and they've never seen anything like this. You know, there were miraculous things happening elsewhere. There were magicians. Now, usually when they, like Simon Magus, Simon the Magician, uh, he did magical things and he was making his living that way and doing pretty well. But when the apostles came along, this is after Jesus, when the apostles came along and he saw what they were able to do, he said, can I buy that? <laughs> Can I, can I pay you to teach me how to do that? Because that's much more impressive than the magic I'm doing. Well, it, there's no indication that his magic was prestidigitation, you know, that his magic was somehow just sleight of hand. The suggestion is he really was doing magic. Um, the, when scripture says, stay away from magicians, stay away from diviners, stay away from fortune tellers and, you know, and witches, Scripture doesn't warn us about that sort of thing over and over again because it's not real. It warns us about that because it is real. Those things really do exist. There is witchcraft. There is the occult. There are evil supernatural things in the world. That's the dark side of the fact that we believe in the spiritual. And so scripture tells us to stay away from that because um, you know, you're messing with fire. You're, you're opening the Pandora's box when you get into that. If you, we are trying to control the natural world, God put the natural world in place and gave it a predictable order for our protection. When we try to subvert something in the natural world by magic or divining or fortune telling or anything else like that, by the occult, then we are trying to uh, use false powers to break the rules that God made. The only one who can set aside the natural order in a, in a miraculous way that's legitimate is God. That's what a miracle is. That's why we sometimes pray for miracles. And God does answer. But apart from that, if we try to do it by incantations and, you know, <clears throat> sacrificing chickens or whatever else it is, 
then we are opening ourselves to the evil of the spiritual world, and that's why we're not supposed to do that. Kenneth? Uh, a great example of that is the Saul with the witch of Endor. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've heard people try to explain that away and say that the witch was so surprised when Samuel appeared. And I don't think that, the, I mean, that's not what the scripture teaches at all. That yeah. the witch was afraid when she suddenly realized it was King Saul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's so many of us in the Western world just deny that out of hand. They say, well, we're too scientific than that. It's not either or. I consider myself a very scientific person, I love the sciences. I thought about going into medicine until I realized there were too many other fun things I wanted to do instead of just, just do pre-med, okay? But we can't believe that this is God's Word and cut out 20% of it and say, well, we don't like that part or we don't understand that part or that's not consistent with, the, with modern culture and so therefore we're just going to get rid of it. I don't think that's called for. I don't think it's possible. Nor does it mean that we have to sacrifice our rationality or our scientific orientation or anything else as those things are appropriate in order to do that. It's not either or. And yet most people think that. Okay. Uh, we believe there is a spiritual world. And so therefore we believe that that spiritual world has a dark side as well as the side that is light. Uh, Don, did you have something? You know, um, the, the current or those, that time when they were casting out demons by the magicians and so on, one would be led to think that that was mostly, not to diminish what happened, but with entertainment. But when Jesus came and he confronted the powers of darkness, it really opened people's eyes. This was a, this was an earth shaker. This was something they had they were not used to. Whatever they had seen in magic circles and things like that didn't compare to this. And this really was a demonstration of his kingdom and his power right. that opened opened a lot of eyes. And and as you mentioned. It's not something that we can afford to just cast aside lightly right. when, we, when we look at, at, at what Jesus did. Yeah. And it's, uh, you're right, Jesus' authority in casting out demons, he doesn't have to wind up. Right. You know, he doesn't have to, <laughs> you know, he doesn't have to work himself up in order to do this. Jesus just said, come out. And the demons came out. They feared him. Uh, they feared him. They recognized him. I mean, there's a lot of pieces to that. But the, the thing about Jesus that was different was the authority. The tendency in all the other sort of magical things and cultic things was that there was always a sense in which they had to drum up some kind of energy in order to get it to happen. And it took a long time. A beautiful example of that would be the prophets of Baal and, and the prophet Elijah, where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest. You know, he did, well, you say your god Baal is, you know, is the main god. Well, let's, let's just see, Elijah says. And there are, what, 200 of them, I think it was. There's a lot of them. And they build two altars. And Elijah says, well, you can go first. Call down fire from your god Baal. And these guys, all day long, they're dancing around and screaming and clanging on cymbals and beating and slashing their arms and crying out. And Elijah's over there talking, trash-talking them the whole time, saying... Is your God asleep? Is it, are you trying to wake him up? Has he gone on vacation? Maybe he's just maybe he's just not around right now. Okay, Elijah is trash talking these guys the whole time while they're trying to make as much noise as they can and generate as much energy as they can to try to get this false god, who I believe probably was a demonic force because Baal is present throughout all of the Old Testament history. Um, and when finally they can't get him to do anything. Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. He says, get water and really soak this, this altar, these, the wood that we have here with the, with the sacrificed animal on it. And then the trench around it, fill that trench up. And then they fill it up. And he goes, okay, fill it up again. And they get it really good and soaked. And he goes, Lord, show them. <coughs> Fire from heaven that consumes this, that burns the water in the trenches. And the prophets of Baal are completely discredited. Well, that's an example. And Jesus was the ultimate example of that, where he didn't have to sort of, not like a, you know, a, a showman. Not like a showman. Not like a cat that has to fluff his fur out in order to look bigger than he really is, okay? Jesus just said, come out of him and be quiet. And it's done.
So there is an authority there that they had never seen before, even though it was not uncommon for there to be magicians and for them to have people who claim to have, you know, this kind of, certain kinds of powers. Okay. Uh, it's two, 2 o'clock. Let's take a break. 10 minutes. We'll come back at 10 after. Let's get started back. Uh, in addition, I talked about Jesus not only using words to explain and give examples of the kingdom of God, but also works. We talked about already uh, healing, miraculous healing of exorcism. A third kind of work that he did are nature miracles, and they're a particular kind of thing. They don't involve people uh, necessarily. Um, usually it's natural forces, that's why we call them natural miracles. It was Jesus walking on the water, calming the storm, multiplying the loaves and fishes, etc. Um, and again, these were seen consistent with the Old Testament prophets as being demonstrations of God's presence and his power. Psalm 89, for instance, says, You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne, throne firm through all generations. Remember, that's the, the, the Messiah is the fulfillment of that. He is, the Messiah was expected to be of the line of David and the one that would reoccupy the throne of David. And it goes on. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. This idea of control over nature, over the, the natural world, to be able to do nature miracles, as we call them, uh, is one of the signs of the presence of God and the presence of the Messiah, the one who would fulfill the promise that was made to and through David. So um, we see a variety of works that Jesus used to demonstrate that he was the personal representative, that in him the power of God, the sovereignty of God was present in their midst. So another question that we would ask is, well, where is the kingdom of God? I'm going to come back a little bit to this. Uh, many people believe that the kingdom of God, as I said before, refers to heaven. That it means the afterlife. It is the eternal reward for Christians. So people talk about the kingdom of God, and a lot of people think that means heaven. But if that were true, then what do we do with the Lord's Prayer? That's as found in Matthew 6, which says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if Jesus instructed us to pray for God's kingdom to come, and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, that seems to establish that the availability of God's kingdom should be throughout all his creation, including the earth, including now, and not just in heaven. You see that? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. That means that kingdom can't be isolated just as being something that's in heaven. That's a misconception that people have that we need to understand that location cannot be limited just to a heavenly kind of location. Um, the Jews had a very similar kind of thing in some of the Jewish prayers to what we read here in the Lord's Prayer. For instance, there's a, a Kaddish prayer. Kaddish is the prayer for the dead or uh, following the dead. And part of the Kaddish prayer is, May God establish his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of all the house of Israel, even speedily and at a near time. So the Jewish prayers for God to establish his kingdom, like the Lord's prayer, identify that the kingdom is to be now, in your lifetime, and close by to you. Uh, likewise, there's a series of benedictions called the 18 benedictions. One of them, benediction number 11, says, Restore our judges as at first and our counselors at the beginning, and reign thou over us. Thou alone, blessed art thou, O Lord, thou lovest judgment. So the benediction is, Lord, rule over us now. Make your presence known now. Let your power, your sovereignty, your kingdom be present in our lives now. So it's not this idea that this is supposed to be heaven you know, far away and later on. We may need to close the windows and stuff because of that noise. Could you, would you mind closing the windows? And also, if the door is open, could we close that? Thank you very much. Now, when we talk about uh, some people believing that God's kingdom is in heaven, well, people say, isn't it true that Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. When we say, where is the kingdom? 
Um, well, let me first do this. The idea of kingdom of heaven. Some people get confused because Matthew, as I said earlier, uses the expression kingdom of heaven rather than kingdom of God. Um, and so people read that, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, if it means the same thing, that means the kingdom of God is in heaven. Well, it doesn't. Matthew's use of kingdom of heaven is sort of a Hebrew um, uh, anomaly. And what, what it is, very simply, it's what we would call a circumlocution. Matthew says, good heaven, or the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God, in the same way that you might say good heavens instead of good God. Good God sounds crass to us, right? Well, uh, Matthew, who was the most Jewish of all the New Testament writers, seemed to especially have a concern about invoking the name of God or saying anything that might sound like an invocation of God's name. Because you remember, the Jews were not allowed to say the name of God. They used a generic word whenever they came across it in the Bible. And in this case, instead of saying the kingdom of God, Matthew, the most Jewish, says the kingdom of heaven. Same thing. And it's just a transposition between that and some of the other Gospels. Carolyn and I were talking about this last night. And her mother, who was a, you know, a saint of saints, her, her sainted mother, used to always say, oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, for heaven's sake. Her mother would never in a million years have said, oh, for God's sake. She would have, you know... Just imagining her saying that gives me the shivers, okay? <laughs> uh, and so you see that for some people, even in our, to our ears, certain ways of using that sounds wrong. Well, that's why Matthew, very Jewish Matthew, says kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God. And it's a little bit of weirdness. But just because Matthew says kingdom of heaven doesn't mean that he's suggesting that the kingdom of God is in heaven. <clears throat> but rather that it's consistent with talking about the kingdom of God as God's reign now over both heaven and the earth. But now the question, doesn't Jesus himself say that his kingdom is not of this world, which would suggest that maybe he's saying my kingdom is in heaven? All right, let's talk about that. Where's the kingdom of, of God? Uh, John 18, 36 says, Jesus said, and he's talking here to Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Now that's how that's often translated. Does that mean that Jesus' kingdom is not here on earth, but it is up in heaven? Is the kingdom of God in heaven? Well, again, we have to go back to the literal translations, uh, to, to what the real meaning of the, of the original words were. In Greek, this word, or this phrase, this passage means, my authority, it says my kingdom, again, power, authority, right to rule, my authority to reign is not from this world. We say of this world, and we think present. But it's literally not from this world. Ek tu cosmu tutu. Not from this world. My kingdom is from another place. Uk esten in tauten. In the Greek. Do you hear the difference between my kingdom is not of this world versus my authority to reign or my kingdom is not from this world? Jesus is not speaking of the location of his kingdom as being in heaven, not of this world, in heaven. He's talking about the source of his royal authority. Where does his authority to rule, his kingdom right to rule, where does it come from? And it comes from God above, not from some earthly source like Pilate, whom he's talking to. Jesus literally is saying, unlike you, Pilate, my authority does not come from earth. It comes from somewhere else. That's very different than saying my kingdom is not here on earth. Got that? This is why there is some real value in being able to go back and look at the original language. Fortunately, there are a lot of study tools out there that you don't have to know the Greek. You can, you can read good commentaries and they will do some of that work for you. You, know, you can read this kind of analysis without having to actually know the Greek language. Although, you know, I should go back and study it. I, you know, I added seminary and I don't really, um, my Greek is no good anymore. So. All right, so where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not in what we call heaven, or at least not entirely in heaven. None of the passages that people interpret as meaning, you know, the kingdom is in heaven. Not Matthew, not Jesus talking to Pilate. There is no way to justify that Jesus is saying the kingdom is not on earth now, but rather is in heaven. It's also true that the kingdom is not merely in our hearts. Now, the misunderstanding that the kingdom is inside me, is in my heart, which is another misunderstanding, 
comes from a mistranslation of another passage, Luke 17, 21. Often, that is translated as reading, the kingdom of God is within you. Okay, that means inside me, and inside me, we talk about being my heart. The actual passage, more accurately translated from Luke 17, is this. Once, on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst, is a much better translation, and this is how most modern translations now translate it. In fact, I use the NIV. Well, NIV has had several different, you know, new translations or new versions over the last 20 years. The original NIV, which came out in 1979 or something, read, the kingdom of God is within you. But the last two versions of the NIV, today's NIV and the 2011 version of the NIV, translate it this way, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. And all you have to do is really think about it. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He's, and he has just been raking the Pharisees over the coal about the fact that, that you know, they're rotten to the core. You know, they're more concerned about how things look on the outside. They're not really obedient to God. Why in the world would he be talking to these guys and say the kingdom of God is within you? He's been making the big point. The kingdom of God absolutely was not within them. But it's a completely different message when he says you're looking for the kingdom of God to arrive and you don't even get that the kingdom of God is already in your midst. What did he mean by that? I'm here. I am the personification, the incarnation of the power of God, the sovereignty of God, the rule of God, and I'm standing right in front of you. That's what that means. It doesn't mean it's inside me or you or the Pharisee. It doesn't mean it's in my heart. It means Jesus was saying, I am in your midst and therefore the kingdom of God is in your midst because he was the incarnate personification of the sovereignty of God come to earth. That's what the incarnation was. God come to earth. Okay. Questions about that? Where is the location? John? It seems to me we've just said where it's not. So well, where, where is it? It is everywhere. The power of That's, God is everywhere that God rules and reigns. And where does God rule and reign? Everywhere. Everywhere. In so heaven does, and on earth. That would include heaven and earth. Absolutely. There is no limit. There are no frontiers or borders. That's, That's why when I said earlier, that one of the first slides I had was some people say that the kingdom of God is in heaven. And some people say the kingdom of God is in your heart. I said, neither one of those is wrong, but they're inadequate. They're only partial. The kingdom of God, when we understand it to be the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the reign of God, the authority of God to rule, and not a location, then that's present everywhere God is present. And But it was particularly focused and intensified and magnified in the incarnate Christ who was himself God. And that's why, why Jesus, as for a point of emphasis, to emphatically make it clear to them when he said, Look here, guys, the kingdom of God is in your very midst. Because that was that was concentrated the power of God in the incarnation. Okay? But the power of God is everywhere God rules. Um, the kingdom of God is everywhere God rules. That is on heaven and earth, all of cre all of the created order. And all of the created order is everything you know, God made. You know, we we really blew it. I mean, we, we, in the Garden of Eden, we really flew it. <laughs> Just not figuring that out. If you, if, no, if, if, if you consider, if you consider of all of His creation of which He rules over, but He had to send a Savior to Earth to save us. Mm -hmm. I mean, because His kingdom is so extensive, it's so perfect and so extensive. Yet, in all of this domain, this dominion of His, there was this species of people who challenged him and, and failed in sin and, yeah. and needed a redeemer. That's amazing. And God rightfully could say, one little thing I told you not to do. And what did you have to do? <laughs> one thing. All the rest was available to you. Okay, so we talked about where the kingdom isn't and where it is. It is everywhere where God has the authority and sovereignty to rule, which is everywhere. It is not isolated just inside me or just in heaven, and we make that mistake. 
So when is the kingdom of God coming? This gets a little bit to the question of, okay, to what, what responsibility do we have to usher in the kingdom of God or to, to make manifest the kingdom of God? Well, this is, people get hung up on this probably even more so than the location of the kingdom of God because there are many places in which Jesus seems to be saying that the kingdom of God is coming in the future. It is something that is yet to be. The Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, meaning not here now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for something that is not yet. And talk about the kingdom come. Again, Matthew 8, Jesus says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of this kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness. There will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They will come. There will be. This is a, these are future tense. Sounds like the kingdom of God is coming later, right? Um, a lot of people believe that, that the kingdom of God is a thing that we're looking forward to. This especially uh, is present in people who make these prophetic announcements about when the consummation, the final coming. And they, they talk about the advent of the kingdom of God when Jesus comes back. You know, the most recent one was Harold Camping, you know, uh, in 2011. When he said, was it December 21st? That, no, that was the Mayans. Yeah. Somebody else. Um, you know, that the world was going to end. Absolutely convinced of it. He was a California TV uh, minister. Um, well, <laughs> we're still here. Okay? But the idea is so often, you know, how um, the, the, how Lindsay's late great planet Earth, uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins' Left Behind series, which have sold 65 million books in the Left Behind series. Late great planet Earth um, in the 70s sold 35 million books. Those things generate a lot of expectation that the Lord is coming back, the kingdom of God is going to be ushered in, they use that language a lot, and the world is going to come to an end as Jesus comes back. And too often they say, okay, and here's all, all the signs are lined up, and so Tuesday at 1 o'clock, you know, better put on your running shoes. Um, the fact is, Jesus makes it very clear, Scripture makes it very clear that we don't know when the Lord is coming back. So there's really two points here. One, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And secondly, we have to ask the question, well, does that mean the kingdom of God is coming in the future anyway? Is that what these passages are referring to? You know, this passage in Matthew, which is an apocalyptic, you know, an end times kind of statement. Well, first off, in Mark 13, Jesus said, But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus said, Even I, Jesus, don't know when the last hour is. So what's wrong with you people that you keep saying you know? In fact, it says several different ways. If you think you know, you're wrong. <laughs> By definition, you're wrong. Okay? Uh, Matthew 24 says, Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. If you think you know when it is, if Harold Camping thinks he knows when it is, if Hal Lindsay thinks he knows when it is, if... Tim LaHaye thinks he knows what it is. If you think you know what it is, you're wrong. De facto. Because we're told that exactly when you think is when it's not. So the Lord will come back when he comes. Most of these passages that seem to suggest that it's a future thing, people wrap up in this apocalyptic expectation for when the Lord is coming back, and they think that is going to be the advent of the kingdom of heaven. But I told you this is complicated about when the kingdom is coming. Because there are other places in which Jesus plainly says that the kingdom of God is here now. Right now. Luke 17 says, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. I just read you this passage. Nor will people say, Here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The Greek is very clear that that's present tense. When Jesus was talking 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Mark 1.15, which is a passage I've used several times already. The time has come, he says, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. 
That's actually in the Greek, the aorist tense. The aorist tense is past tense. The kingdom of God has come near, past tense. It's here. And then Matthew 12, 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Again, present tense. So, what is it? Is it future? Is it yes. past? Is it present? Is yes. it now? Yes. 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 Good for you. Um, the, this is one of the things that get, get people uh, bothered. That, you know, oh, nail it down for me. <laughs> Sometimes it's not that easy. Because again, think back to what we said the kingdom of God means. It is the rule and sovereignty and power and reign of God. Which is everywhere. Well, it's not only everywhere, it's every when. It was, it is, it will be to come. You know, the past and future king kind of thing. So when we talk about when is the kingdom of God coming, how are we to understand Jesus when he says, well, if the kingdom of God is here and now, and yet it's something that's not yet happened in the future, it is already and it is not yet. It is both present and it is future. So how do you understand that? Well, Mark Roberts, I mentioned I'm using a lot of his material. He has several analogies that he uses. One of them is he has a PhD, and he said when he defended his PhD in May of 97 or whenever it was, um, he presented, he, he defended in front of four faculty members at Harvard. They excused him for 20 minutes. He came back and they said, we've unanimously accepted your dissertation. Congratulations, Dr. Roberts. At that moment, he had fulfilled all the obligations to be a doctor, PhD. But he said, the fact was, I wasn't really a PhD for another month. Because until I had paid all my fees, until I had fulfilled all the obligations of the school, until I went through the ceremony and received the document, I didn't legally have a right to call myself a PhD, even though those professors had told me that. I was already a PhD, but not quite yet. An analogy that I thought as I was working on this is our new church building. We've paid the deposit. We've signed the agreement to purchase it. All of that's done. We're already doing some work on the building. We took the roof off and all, you know, we're designing, we're planning, all that. So for all intents and purposes, we bought the building. Except we don't sign the final document and give them the final check until next Tuesday. So it, it's our building, but it's not yet. Already, but not quite yet. There's a sense in which, um, as I say, the, with regard to the kingdom of heaven, the contract has been signed, the deal is set, but the final closing hasn't occurred, and so we can't take possession fully of what is ours. That's what Jesus was talking about, about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The deal is set. The deal is done. It is finished. Jesus' last words from the cross. Okay? It is finished. It's all set. Only, yeah, we still got to go through that closing. <laughs> I had a friend of mine once um, ask me about a U2 song, which you may know. Um, still haven't found what I'm looking for. You know that song? These are the words of one, one of the, the uh, verses and the start of the chorus. I believe in the kingdom come when all the colors will bleed into one, bleed into one. Well, yes, I'm still running. You broke the bonds and you loosed the chains. We're talking about Jesus here. Bono is singing about Jesus. You broke the bonds and you loosed the chains. Carry the cross of my shame, of my shame. You know I believe it. But then the chorus. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I had a friend of mine ask me in a class one time in Seattle, what does that mean? Bono professes to be a Christian, and I, I'm good with that. If somebody says they are, I'm going to accept that. Uh, and he sings about Jesus carrying the cross of his shame. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Well, I told my friend, Vicki, uh, who visited here recently, some of you met Vicki, um, that I think Bono is talking about already and not yet. That yes, Jesus has completely, he, he carried my sins on the cross. He forgave me, but for now, I still have to live in this very hard world. 
And so while I accept that and I believe it and I am saved in that, until the final consummation, until the kingdom of God is fully realized, I'm still struggling here. I still haven't completely found what I'm looking for, which is freedom from the pain and the grief and the loss and the, the satisfaction of heaven. Okay? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. That's the already not yet that I think Jesus is talking about in the kingdom of God. Kenneth. Romans chapter 8 is a perfect illustration. For the creation uh, was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Right. And talks about that, you know, um, our spirit groans in, in that too deep for us even to know how to pray and so the Holy Spirit prays. We still struggle with this, even though we're saved. Even though we have that satisfaction and that fulfillment. It's not yet. Fulfilled. The kingdom of God has not been made fully manifest to us, even though the power of God is everywhere. John? Um, what you were saying at the first hour about his, his sovereignty and his authority being the kingdom of God, you could probably say dominion, his dominion as the kingdom of God. You can't divorce that from who he is. You can't separate his authority from who he is. They're, they're, they're inseparable. Which would You're mean, not suggesting I'm, I'm saying no, 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 okay. I'm, I'm making a point here. Which would mean that, that because God is omnipresent in both space and time, thus his kingdom reigns in both space and time. Which for me makes it very, a little bit easier to understand that what we have today will be fulfilled tomorrow. It exists tomorrow. It existed yesterday because Jesus, you know, the Father occupies time, not in a linear fashion. He's, right. he's omnipresent in all time. Thus, his kingdom is as well. Right. So it, it makes it a little bit easier for this Western Christian to, okay. to, to understand. Good. Okay. Um, let's keep going. How is the kingdom of God to appear? I've talked about where is it, when is it, Talk about how we will we will see the kingdom of God appear. How is the fulfillment? What will it look like? How's it going to work? We need to understand again. I've talked about this a lot, and we'll continue to talk about this through all the classes we have because it's so foundational to Christianity and to Jesus' mission. First century Jews expected a Messiah, an anointed king. They thought he would come and drive out the Gentile oppressors, who at that point were the Romans, before that had been the Seleucids, before that had been the Babylonians, before that the Assyrians. They've always had some oppressor. The Messiah was expected to come and drive off the Gentile oppressors, the Romans of the first century, and make Israel a great nation again. Well, that's what they thought the Messiah was for. That's what the Messiah was going to do. So Jesus comes along and isn't that. He doesn't do that. In fact, he eats with tax collectors and sinners, tax collectors being the people who have aligned themselves with the power of Rome. He heals the centurion's son. He, you know, he has no apparent, Jesus had no apparent sense of what his job was, <laughs> according to the first century Jews. And so the same Jews that expected the Messiah so, so intently rejected Jesus because exactly because he did not affirm what they expected the Messiah would do, nor how they thought the kingdom of God would be manifest in Israel. Because remember, the expectation that the Jewish people had and have for the coming of the Messiah and for the establishment of the kingdom of God, and they had that expression, is very much like what we expect in heaven. I mean, the idea of a new heaven and a new earth is an Old Testament concept. For them, salvation doesn't mean you accept Jesus Christ and you're made righteous and your sins are forgiven. To the Jewish people, salvation meant returning from exile. Salvation was defined as return from exile. Because they've always, almost always been in exile somewhere. In Egypt, in Babylon, you know, wherever. And they were in exile up until the 1940s when they returned to the homeland. So that's what they see as salvation. But the idea was that the coming of the Messiah was supposed to usher in this new age, which would be the kingdom of God. And it would involve the return of the Jews to the Promised Land and the establishment of Israel. And, you know, that they were going to be the top dogs over the whole creation, the way it was intended to be since they were the chosen people. But because Jesus wasn't all of that, 
and they didn't get another Messiah to fulfill that, a lot of people thought, thought that Bar Kokhba in 130 AD, the 130s AD, you know, Jesus wasn't in uh, the 30s. People, they kept thinking that somebody's going to be the Messiah. Well, after Jesus wasn't, the frustration level got more and more and higher and higher for the Jews, so that they tried to force God's hand, in effect, in the 60s, especially 66 AD, and fight back. They said, well, okay, God hasn't sent the Messiah. Maybe he wants us to just do it ourselves. So they, they rebelled against the Romans, and as a result of that rebellion in AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple were completely destroyed. And they were dispersed again. It was another diaspora, another spreading out of the Jews. And some of them, you know, came back later on. And then 60 years later in 130, when Hadrian, who was then the Roman emperor, decides he's going to rebuild Jerusalem since it was just a ruin, he's going to rebuild Jerusalem and he's going to dedicate it to one of the Roman gods and name it for one of the Roman gods. Well, the Jews got their energy back over that one, and they had a leader, Mark Kochba, who they thought was perhaps the Messiah. And they got behind him, and they rebelled against the Romans and fought him again, and they crushed them all. Killed Bar Kokhba, destroyed his army. That was it. Okay? They were really scattered then. Next time we really hear from the Jewish people as a people, in terms of uh, geographically oriented as anything, in the 1940s. So it was pretty conclusive. Was that Masada? No. Masada, Masada is a different thing. Masada happened, was actually right after the 80s, 70s. Masada was the last holdout of the zealots. So it had nothing to do with this man. didn't have anything to do with Bar Kokhba. What happened was when they destroyed Jerusalem, the Romans then went you know, around the rest of Palestine, rooting out any last vestiges of the zealot movement, the anti-Roman movement. Well, the zealots had, through trickery earlier than that, Masada had been a palace of Herod the Great. And they had got, weaseled their way in there and they had taken it over. And if you all know what Masada is, it's this palace complex right on the top of this unbelievable um, butt, you know, this, this butte, um, down near the Dead Sea. And it, it looks, how could anybody ever attack this? Well, the Romans did. The, uh, the Romans, in fact, they built a dirt ramp up 300 meters or something, you know, to get to the top. It took years. And they conquered them. That was the last holdout of any of the opposition, Jewish opposition to Rome. But that was still in the 70s. That was before, long time before Bar Kokhba was in the long 30s. Okay. So that's what the Jews expected. And because Jesus wasn't giving them what they expected in terms of reinstituting the kingdom of God, which is how what they thought it was, then they rejected him, and they ended up trying to do it themselves, and Israel was destroyed. So, how is the kingdom of God? Jesus said the kingdom of God would not come through human strength. Again, we do not usher in the kingdom. We do not bring the kingdom. It would not come from strength, but from weakness. It would not come through military victories, but it would uh, come through what appeared to be a defeat. It would not come through hatred and violence, but instead through sacrificial love. And I'm talking, of course, about the cross, which was a violation of everything the Jews expected. It was an abomination to them. Mark 8, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Jesus answered, you are the Messiah. And again, some of the other uh, Gospels say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, it is not by human knowledge you know that, but this is given to you by God. And then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. If we stop right there, that all sounds really good. Jesus has been acknowledged by his followers as being the Messiah. But Mark doesn't stop there. It goes on. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's him, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus receives the ultimate confession, and this confession of Peter in Caesarea Philippi is considered one of the highlights, one of the most significant points of Jesus' ministry. When the disciples very pointedly, at Peter's, with Peter's leadership, recognize who and what he is, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Okay, you guys get it. 
I'm the Messiah. That's great. And Jesus immediately turns around and starts telling them that he's going to die. That the Messiah is not going to be what they think he is, what all of the Jews thought he was, a military leader to free them from Roman rule. Jesus immediately turns around and starts telling them, yeah, you guys are right, I'm the Messiah. Now let me tell you how I'm going to be completely rejected and denied and the Roman authority, the uh, Jewish authorities are going to have me crucified and killed. And Peter, who has just confessed that he's Messiah, takes him aside and says, what are you talking about? You can't talk like that. What's wrong with you? You're going to make these guys depressed. You can't be saying this kind of stuff. And do you remember what Jesus says to, to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. But this little, this little story here was both the high point of the recognition of the apostles of who Jesus was, the establishment of his role of Messiah, and he does not correct them. He does not say, no, 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 shh, that's not right. I'm not. Uff, 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 uff. No. He accepts their statement, and then he turns around and tells them, and now that you know that I'm the Messiah, let me tell you what that means. I am going to die. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be arrested and crucified and die. So Jesus' whole point was the, king, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, the consummation of the kingdom of God, was going to be done in a way that they could never have imagined, and in fact was an offense to them. Now again, the kingdom of God exists everywhere at all times, because it is the rule and power of God. But Jesus was the, as you said, John, by his personification, by his very being, was the, um, the super intensified presence of God to them. He was a magnification of the presence of God in the midst by being the incarnate God, the, the God who became a man. But the way that that was all going to play out, that it, the fulfillment of the presence of the kingdom of God was not going to be the way anybody expected it. So, where have we gone with all this? Let's talk about a summary. <coughs> What was Jesus' primary message? His primary message is found in Mark 1.15, I believe. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near, repent, and believe the good news. Jesus was saying, the rule of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, the reign of God is right in front of you. It is personified in me. It has come near to you in me. <coughs> Listen, pay attention, repent, Believe the good news about God's power having come to you in person. Again, the kingdom of God does not refer to the place where God rules. It's not a location, but rather to the presence and power of God's actual rule and reign. The kingdom is here when God exercises his rightful authority over his creation. God made all creation. He rules it all. His, his kingdom exists everywhere if we are open to it. Well, we should be open to it. But Jesus was the intense personification of that. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God in words and in works, both by what he said and by what he did. The kingdom of God is not primarily in heaven. It is not primarily inside us or in our hearts, but rather is everywhere that God reigns over his creation. And obviously, when we receive God's reign, then the, the kingdom of God is more evident to us in our lives. We experience the manifestation of the power of God in our lives because God doesn't force himself on anybody. You know, God is the all-powerful God and he rules everything. But God gives us some choice about how much we let him in. And so therefore God, you know, if we talk, if there's any sense in which we usher in the kingdom, the only thing that can ever mean is that we allow ourselves like the little children to receive more of God's power and presence in our lives but not like we have anything to do with making it happen any more than we make the plants grow, to use the parable of the kingdom in Mark 4. The kingdom of God is already here, but not yet fully realized. We've signed the deal, but we haven't taken possession yet. It is already, and, and it is not yet. That's part of the tension. That's what we, that's what we wait for. We believe it's real. We believe it's true. We are anxious for it. But we still haven't found everything we're looking for. And the kingdom of God will not be fulfilled, as I said, by human effort, but by the culmination of Jesus' sacrificial act on the cross. That's the thing that set the stage for the final act of God's 
kingdom, the kingdom of God, to be fully manifest in the creation <coughs> in the way that it's not right now. Okay? So that's a summary. One last thing I want to do is talk about, well, given that, how do we then live? What was Jesus saying to us? First, we should seek to live each moment in the reality of God's kingdom. When Jesus said the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, he gave us instructions. What are we supposed to do with that? Repent, believe the good news, accept the fact that the kingdom of God was personified in the incarnation and came to us. Receive that, accept it. Accept Jesus. That's the first and foremost thing. That's the way we primarily should live in the realization of God's kingdom. Then we should live in the world as salt and light. Jesus said, you are the salt of the world, you are the light of the world. And I've said many times to our congregation, you can't be the salt of the world and the light of the world if you never get close enough to non-Christians for them to taste you and see you. Which means we are supposed to be a witness. We are supposed to reflect the truth of the kingdom of God to those who don't yet realize it, who don't yet, who have not yet recognized the kingdom of God has come. Repented, believed it, accepted Jesus. We are supposed to be salt and light, the witnesses, the ones that reflect the light of Christ to the world. Third, we need to take up our own cross daily and follow Jesus. Which means, that's the focus of our lives. We wake up in the morning, and we realize today, this is, this is your day, God. Show me how you want me to live this day. Not what I want, what you want. And if it means doing hard things, which is what taking up your cross has to mean, even if it means doing difficult things, making sacrifices, that's what we're called to do. That's the job. There's a, there's a TV show, Dirty Jobs. You ever see it? Okay, it's this guy who went around, I can't imagine, you know, he became quite a personality. I've seen him do ads and all kinds of stuff. And he went from one ugly, stupid, filthy, stinking, you know, painful job to the next. And that was this whole show, this reality show where he was just going and seeing what's it like to work at this. He didn't just go talk to these people. He got in there and did it. You know, everything from cleaning out stuck pipes and sewers to all that kind of stuff. Well, that was his job. That's what they, they paid him for. That's what, you know, that's what he did. Well, I'm not saying that our jobs, that being a Christian is that bad. <laughs> but if we get called to do hard things or smelly things or whatever, that's part of our job. You know, we're soldiers, and soldiers do what they're told to do. Um, people don't like to say that. People, people want it to be all sweetness and light. They don't want to suggest that we have responsibilities. We don't do those things in order to be saved. It's not like if we don't do them, God's going to condemn us. We do it as an act of obedience and gratitude for the fact that God has blessed us so much, that he has loved us and saved us. <coughs> don't be good so that God can love you. Let God love you so that you can be good. Well, once we've been saved, once we let God love us, Part of it is that we may be given tough assignments to do, even sacrificial assignments to do. And we do it because he loved us and we love him. And fourth, we should live in both the present power and in the future hope of the resurrection. Already, but not yet. We celebrate what is and we look forward with hope to what's to come. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about, you know, now abides these three, faith, hope, and love. He says the greatest of these is love. Well, we all agree with that. I mean, what are all of our songs about? Um, we talk a lot about love. We talk quite a bit about faith. We don't talk nearly enough about hope. There is a hope in the Christian faith that does not exist elsewhere. And that's brought home to me every time I do a memorial service. I honestly can't imagine what I would say if I were doing a, a funeral for somebody that I knew was not a Christian. I've, not, I've never been asked to do that. And it would be hard. But when I'm doing a funeral service or a memorial service for a Christian, I talk about the hope, the knowledge that we are, that it doesn't end here. That however difficult it was getting to that point, that the, the, the brother or sister in the Lord that has died is now experienced the fulfillment of that hope that we have. And we don't, I don't think we spend enough energy or thought recognizing that Christianity is a religion of hope as much as anything else. And what do we hope for? We hope for the future fulfillment of the promise of the kingdom of God. God's reign, where there will be no more suffering or dying or grief or pain 
and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That's not pie in the sky by and by. That's why we're willing to sacrifice between now and then. But we believe that that will be the reward. Questions about any of that? Do you have a sense of why the kingdom of God is so important now? Yes. As Jesus' theme. If you didn't, then I failed miserably at just wasted two hours of all of our time. Okay? Ron? I can understand so much better how uh, John the Baptist felt in asking, are you really? Yeah. Yeah. Also, this thing of, of being in the kingdom identifies who we are. Mm -hmm. It really presents who we are, something like a, a hybrid between a soldier, a subject, and a son. Mm -hmm. You know, right? It, it puts it puts perspective, value, importance, and and in the right perspective on why I'm alive. Yeah. Yeah. We are children of the kingdom. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the kingdom. I'm also a soldier of the kingdom. Um, and so I enjoy the grace and love of the Father as being a child of the kingdom, but I also accept the responsibilities of being a soldier of the kingdom. But first you have to have a sense of what the kingdom is. And who the king is. Who the king is. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So there's a picture of Masada on page 52 in our text. Okay, page 52, you can see what it must have been like for the Romans to walk up there the first time and go, okay, how are we going to do that? But it's also a symbol of Roman tenacity that it took them, I think, two years. But the, you can see, and that, if that's the picture I'm thinking of, you can see the ramp, right? On the right-hand side, you can see that ramp. They built that out of dirt in order to get to the top of Masada and, and break through and, and defeat the last of the zealots. So don't mess with the Roman Empire. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Again, remember, tomorrow, if you are in the church history class, it meets tomorrow here at 1 o'clock, not on Friday.